right, all right, all right. Hey, um, listen, I got to tell you what Kamani and I just did this week. We, we just got back from a three-day backpacking trip on the Sillimore Creek in the Ozark Mountains. And uh, yeah, I don't know why you're clapping for that, but you can clap because I survived. Because uh, I tell you, that's no joke, man. We're 13 and a half miles in the mountains. But um, I, it was amazing. I, I went in thinking about the sovereignty of God. And it's just something about being out in nature, especially around the mountains and all that beauty. It just reminds you of his sovereignty. And uh, that's one of the reasons I love Arkansas so much, because we have so much opportunity to enjoy him in nature. Uh, but when I did get back that, that Friday, I felt like that I needed all my joints replaced. Uh, but I'm feeling great now and uh, back to normal. But just want to tell you guys, it was a blast, real refreshing. And uh, what a crazy week it's been uh, around here just in general. And let me tell you what I'm praying for all of you right now. I am praying that you will be encouraged today by the spirit of the living God, that you will be filled with his spirit to overflowing, even baptized in the Holy Spirit. I mean, I'm talking, you guys, you need Jesus more than ever. And we're going to get into that. Uh, It's pretty obvious, but uh, how do you get that? Well, here's what you do. You show up here and you worship Jesus with all your might. That's how you do it. You worship God. That's how you get filled with the Spirit. You worship the name that's above every name. And uh, so we're praying that for you guys, that you'll experience that. Uh, just the, Hey, let me say something I told the first service. We as a church, Christians, we have to stop looking at gathering with our church family on Sundays as game time for us. This is not game time for you guys. This is halftime for you. This is where you come in here, you get filled up, you get encouraged, and then you go out to your field. That's game time. Your workplace, your school, your family, come on somebody, (laughs) okay? That's your field. And so stop looking at this as like some kind of game time for Christians. This is halftime for you. Make adjustments, get encouraged, get back out there, and make a touchdown for Jesus. Amen? Got to throw that out there. This weekend then, here's what we're going to do. By the way, I just want to stop and say, I could have worshiped with that last song for about 30 more minutes. Hope has a name. What's his name? Can you say it louder? Can you say it even louder than that? Okay, about 10 times louder than that might be a little slice of heaven. But I'm going to tell you, thank thank you, Cole and Chuck and, and all of them who lead us. Give them a hand. Darren was over here without a guitar. I mean... That was great. It just shows you, man. We just, when you just open your mouth and sing to God, he just shows up because that's what he does. So this weekend, though, I want to talk to you about something. Some of you, you're not going to, you're not going to get this. I think you will maybe later, but uh, I want to talk to you about something that's really normal in every Christian's life, and that is called persecution. Persecution. And uh, we're going to, that's just a, by the way, if you're following Jesus, you will face this. Jesus said it. The Word said it. We'll look at several of those verses. Um, Again, some of you are going through some of that right now. Some of you aren't. But what does that word mean, persecution? It's a very churchy, Christianese word uh, that really just means harassment, uh, you know, bullying even. We like that word in today's culture. Uh, Belittling, these kind of things, and much worse. But uh, those of you with kids, y'all look at me, with grandkids, Here's the thing, we're going to learn some principles right now, and God's going to show us how to deal with this in our life. But what's cool for for some of you with kids or grandkids, you're going to be able to teach these principles to them. They're going to be able to learn how to handle it. They're going to learn about life, okay? And so don't waste these principles. Use them as well uh, when your kids are facing something like this. So I'm going to set this up for a while before we hit some of these principles because I need you to understand something. Y'all look at me. I'm going to really pastor you today and let you understand that our world, okay, our world is getting increasingly sinful. Um, It is also getting increasingly opposed to Christian values that come from the Word of God. Okay, so uh, I know know you probably have already noticed this, but really, even in our own country, many of our values as Christians, you know, they used to be the cultural norm here in this country, like you go back to the 1950s, for instance. I mean, it, it, it's insane how much we've changed. You, you, put, you put a movie on, like, 
nowadays a movie that's like, say, PG rated, and you show it in the 50s, and, and there would be like rioting in the streets with some of the stuff that's in those movies. There's a sliding moral scale going on. Y'all still with me? And, uh, and so, so it used to be we could just say, well, the cultural norms are pretty close to our biblical values, so we're good if we, if we all stay together. That is changing rapidly. That is not the case anymore. When I was growing up, look, there were sins that even the secular media wouldn't touch. They wouldn't talk about them. They wouldn't show them. I mean, there were certain things you did not see on Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley. Anybody remember those shows? Now, when Three's Company came out, all bets were off. But I'm just telling you, I grew up in the 80s. Can you tell? See, our nation has lost that. And uh, those same sins that I'm referring to, now it's like I'm seeing them on every commercial. And, uh, and so, are y'all still here? But also, there's places around the world that Christian values, that those are seen as the enemy in their culture. Um, we're not like that yet. Thank God, okay? But in the last days, here's what you need to know as a Christ follower. It will not be easy to be salt of the earth. It will not be easy to be the light of the world. Jesus has given us that role. You, you understand this? And it will not be easy. In fact, I want you to understand this too. The Bible talks about this, that when evil is called good by the world and good is called evil and you're clinging to your biblical values, then you will be considered evil. Oh, it's coming. It already has in some areas of our lives. And uh, so let's look at what Jesus said. Matthew 5, verse 10 through 12. Is it okay just to talk about this today? Good. Matthew 5, verse 10 through 12. Blessed. Everybody say blessed. Blessed. That means happy, fortunate, filled with God's favor. You're excited. Blessed. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Wow. For righteousness' sake. In other words, not because you stirred something up. (laughs) That happens too, right? Some of y'all got some... Real, real, real aggressive personalities. But this is saying, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's a great promise. But what else? Blessed are you when they revile. Notice Jesus didn't say, if they revile you. He said what? When they revile you, revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you, talking about the world, saying all kinds of evil against you falsely, For my sake, Jesus said, you're a follower of Christ. You identify with me. They're going to say things against you. So revile. There's a a word we don't use every day in our language, revile. (laughs) But all it really means is abusive language against you, uh, spreading lies about you, these kind of things. So it means spreading the dumb things that you did do. (laughs) That's gossip, right? But also spreading things that you didn't do. That's false accusation. That's an attack. This persecution. Y'all still here? And then verse 12, look at this. Rejoice. Say that word. Rejoice, man. Rejoice. Like throw a party. Be exceedingly glad for when all this stuff happens to you. Why? For great is your reward. I say great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Man, and I talked to you a little bit about how even our church, this was last week, I mentioned briefly that we've experienced just a little, a little taste of this. But here's the thing. As believers, Jesus, what does he say? That we, as Christ followers, are to respond differently to opposition than the world responds, right? So that's why when you, you're on Facebook, you see a huge difference between Christ followers and, well, never mind, I've seen some of your Facebooks, okay? Uh, maybe it's not that big of a difference, but this is the way it should be, ready? We don't react to opposition. We don't react. Nobody has the power over my actions. That's for the Holy Spirit. Only, that's the only, one, that's the only person that has power, that should be that way. We, we, we don't destroy I don't, I, don't, I don't go ballistic when I have opposition and like throw people under the bus, right? We, also, when we have opposition in our lives, we, we don't determine that other person's future. You know what I mean? Like we don't, through our words or actions, we don't determine their future. 
I and you, we, we, we leave that in God's hands. Just like my, my, my future is in the hands of God. That's where it should be. But here's what you have to understand, guys. This is truth right now. The world is broken. It's why we need Jesus. The world is broken because of sin. And, and God tells us to, he's saying, don't be surprised. Some of y'all act surprised when the world is angry and when they're mean and they don't do things that Christ would say that we should do. No, the world is going to be abusive. The world is going to fuss at you. They're going to throw you under the bus. They're going to make you feel little. I'm telling you right now, don't be surprised, he's saying. I always, it, it freaks me out sometimes when Christians are surprised that the world acts like the world. Controlling, manipulative, pushy. John 16, 33. He says, these things, Jesus said this, these things I have spoken to you, I'm telling you about this stuff, so that in me you may have peace. Like if you were blindsided by all this, you'd, you'd be like, what's going on? Because you're going to know about this. You know this is the way the world is. In the world you will have tribulation. And I'm telling you about it, he says. But thank God for the butts in the Bible. Because typically behind those things is something good. But be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Be of, turn to somebody and say, be of good cheer. Don't you say that every day? Right? Be of good cheer. I have what? Jesus said, I have overcome the world. Hey, listen, all this is true, but he says, you know what? You're going to have trouble. You're going to have difficulty. Maybe some people will even harass you. That's coming, but don't worry about it. Hey, have a party. Rejoice because you know what? The world's already defeated by me. I've already overcome the world. And if you're with me, you can rejoice with me. And Jesus said this also, when we enter the last days, things will get even worse. Not better, right? It is not, it's not, look, the world is not going to get better and happier and glad and better and unicorns and rainbows and butterflies will increase and everything's going to get better and better and then we're going to go to heaven. That is not the pattern that the Bible depicts, <laughs> especially not the unicorns part. But look, it's going to get worse. It's going to get more vile. The world is going to get more violent, blatantly anti-God in your face more and more and more. Okay, and then heaven will come get us after we're done with what we're supposed to do here. Or we'll go on to heaven, whichever comes first. Second Timothy three, verse one through four. Look at this. Paul is telling Timothy, he says, but know this, like see this, understand this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Now, I believe we're on the edge of the last days, man, if not. Gosh, I mean, all these things that we're talking about in the Bible, so many are happening. See if this looks familiar to you or sounds familiar. This is going to be the last days. For men will be lovers of themselves. I could stop right there. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, there's a lot of bad uns in that one. Slanders without self-control. Brutal. Despisers of good. Traitors. So no loyalty there. Headstrong. This is the end times. This is last days. People will look like this. They'll be haughty. Like all puffed up. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Does any of this sound familiar to you? Does any of this sound familiar to you? Yeah, like the world we live in right now. Now, let me, let me pause and, and say something about harassment and even just bullying. There, that term we like in our culture. We, like, we don't like the, the action, but we use that word a lot. It's very different today, okay? Um, it's, it's interesting to me because like open harassment doesn't come in person as much as it used to. Like back in the day, man, you know, like if somebody had a problem with me, you know, I'd get my boys, he'd get his boys, and we'd rumble. Rumble, that's like a 1950s word, right? <laughs> like the socias versus the greasers, man. You'd get out there, and you'd be in the parking lot, and you'd take care of it with some chains and some pipes, you know? you just go after it. But, uh, man, it is not like that now. Now, aggressive behavior, and it's, it's like threats, slander, spreading lies. And it's usually done, you know what, by a keyboard warrior, And it happens mostly through texting, 
through social media. Am I right? I mean, this is aggressive behavior now. Even, even through the video games your kids are playing online, this is happening. And the purpose of this is still the same. It's intimidation, harassment, all of this. So, someone exerts power over you until you show weakness. In the Bible, you see lots of examples of this. Goliath, you remember him? He did this to the Israelites. He stood out there and defied them. He said, none of you can even come close. You don't even deserve to be on the same battlefield with me. You're a bunch of dogs. Who are you going to send to fight me? Intimidation. Harassment. Oh, Jezebel. Y'all remember her in the Bible? Jezebel did this to Elijah. Right after Elijah called down fire, this great miracle for God. And then the next day... (laughs) Jezebel threatens his life, and he freaks out, runs away. He's scared. He has panic attacks, anxiety. It's all in the Word of God. He has suicidal thoughts. Oh, yes. He's experiencing this intimidation. And we know that bullies and people that are harassing others, they, they, they'll attack, use anything. They typically use things in your life to try to intimidate you, like your appearance or your abilities or your disabilities or even like your accent, the way you talk. I feel bad for Boudreaux and Thibodeau, those guys. Your race, that's a big one. Some, some places, it's your gender, um, whether you're rich or poor. But here's a big one, your faith. Being a Christ follower. Like you're identif- identifying with, look, I'm a Christian. I do what Jesus says. He's the most important thing in my life. And uh, by the way, that one, as far as, taking harassment for that, that's on a worldwide increase. This has been happening for 2,000 years since Jesus came. But recently, like the last decade or so, it's skyrocketed. I mean, you see real persecution around the world, okay? Um, And it's hard for some of us to relate because we live in a country that is very protected from that. Still, still now, we, we live in probably the best country for religious freedoms. And uh, even now we have that. So as far as our level of anti-Christian persecution that we take, especially where we live, it's not very high compared to some places. I remember back in the 90s, my, my, my friend Jason, his name was, he was a missionary in China. And of course that was all covert. And we, we were, I was a part of a team that went there on a research project, a short-term missions trip. And uh, he was leading us. And we had to be so careful on how that we did things in that country. Like we couldn't go in there busting up like all the Americans want to do, you know. We're going to preach the gospel. Man, we could have gotten Christian believers in China in real trouble. Like I'm talking their families would have been in harm's way. Because co- the communists, they want to be God, okay. The, like the human secularism at its peak is communism. You understand this, right? It's like you look to us. They don't even like any religion, not just, not just Christianity, because they want, look, humanistic thinking is the thing. You look to us, we provide. And so we had to be very careful. And, uh, and I was thinking it was my exposure to this. And if you've never lived outside the United States, you can't relate. But I remember thinking, man, just seeing the locked down feel of that place, and uh, Jesus was thriving in the underground churches there. And it was like, man, and they love God with all their heart. But I was thinking, let me compare that to the persecution I face in the United States for being a Christian. What? As a pastor, I might get a, a, a rough email, and it hurt my feelings. Wah. I mean, this is, this, is this really comparable? No, it's not. Here's some facts from around the world. There are 150 countries where Christians are severely persecuted. Now, in those, there's like a top 50 that are the worst that that are on what's called the world watch list. And in those 50 countries, 245 million Christians, our brothers and sisters, live under severe persecution. That's discrimination. They can't buy and sell things. Unlawful arrests. Prison. For being a Christian, refugee camps, even tortured and martyred for being a Christian. And in 2018, it's in those same countries, 4,136 were killed just for being Christians. That's 11 per day in a year. I'm not talking about caught up in a war. I'm talking about just straight up, you love Christ, 
we kill you. In that same, in that same region, the 50, 50 countries I'm talking about, 1,266 churches were burned to the ground in that same year. I mean, this is just a yearly stat. In North Korea alone, do you know that it's estimated around 70,000 are in prison camps simply because of their confession of their faith in Christ? Man, I'm telling you, the, the most persecuted group on the planet, you know what it is? Christians. Christians. And that's from the International Society of Human Rights. 80%, they say, of the world's atrocities are aimed against Christians. Now, would you say typically that, the, that you would think that? I'm telling you right now, it is a demonic lie that turns around and acts almost like, like people think that Christians are the ones that are the ones persecuting everybody. Like it's all, it's all the Christians that are doing this and it is the exact opposite, but that goes back to good being called evil and evil being called good. This is, this is where we're at. I think it's good for us to remember these stats. It's very good for you and I as American Christians to remember this. That's called persecution. They're going through it. John 15, 19 through 20, Jesus said, Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, what else does he say? They will also persecute you. And again, this is a normal thing for a Christian. How many of y'all would agree they did not tell me this when I got saved at VBS? <laughs> I mean, it's like, I didn't sign up for that, right? But here's the cool thing. Now, look, that's heavy, some of the stuff we talked about. Y'all look at me, though. God has a way to deal with all this. And we're going to spend some time looking at three principles right now. Three principles. God has a way to deal with all of this. And again, let's get this not just for us, but for our children. Let's dive into this. Ready? Number one, you're facing, you're facing persecution. The first thing you have to do is I must recognize the source behind it all. If I ever forget this, listen, I've talked to you guys about this before. You've got to recognize the source of opposition in your life. Because if not, you're going to find yourself fighting against your mother-in-law. <laughs> If, if you, some of y'all are like, but brother, you don't know my mother-in-law. Listen, it's not her. I'm going to show you this. Somebody might say, well, I'm having a real problem with my mother-in-law or my boss or somebody at school, a professor or, or you know, a city official, somebody. And, uh, and, and, and let, let me say, if you picked a fight with those people, well, that's just consequences of your actions. But there's truth here as well. There is a spiritual evil force that hates you. Satan. We don't talk about them a lot here, but it's true. Sometimes, look, sometimes in your life, people like you for no reason. Like, they, they just like you, right? They just, they just like you. You know what that's called? That, you know what that is called? The favor of God on your life. But sometimes people are against you, even though you did nothing to warrant it. That's a spiritual attack. Do y'all get it? I see some heads shaking like, yeah, I do. I get it. That's a spiritual attack. And you got to recognize that. There is a force behind the source. And uh, look, it's, it's like when we do short-term missions trips, and we're going to get back to that uh, in 2021, God willing, we're praying for that. But uh, when we are on these missions trips, we're helping other churches around the world, and we're there, things will start going wrong. <laughs> Just things start going bad for seemingly no reason. What do we do as a team? Our teams, some of you have been on these trips. We gather up. We recognize it's a spiritual attack. We say, we need to pray. Well, can I propose to you that we have to get more like this in our everyday lives? This is a spiritual attack. We got to get our friends, get our life group. Let's pray. We got to pray. Are y'all still here? Because why? Because Ephesians 6.12. That's why. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Told you but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Now, who in here is glad that Jesus has already defeated all of them? Right? Me too. But we're still in the fight. I mean, we're still on this broken planet, and we need to recognize the source. And by the way, that's why I love the people who pray for our church. We have life groups who just do that. There's one that meets 
right here. They kind of huddle up right there. Wednesdays at noon, they pray for our church. I thank God for them. Look, I want all of you to pray for our church. Can you do that for me? Please do that. Pray for your pastors. Pray, pray for the staff. Pray for this church. Pray for our leaders here. Man, we need prayer. Why? Because of Ephesians 6.12. And we can go into it. The rest of that verse talks about how to pray. But have you ever thought about this? That bully is not really your problem. <laughs> that family member, as irate as they may get you, they're not really your problem. They, that person is just being used. You, you, you with me? That person is just being used. See, we're not fighting against human beings. We already looked at that. We're fighting against wicked spiritual forces that you can't see with your natural eyes. And Satan can use anybody any way he wants to, whenever he wants to, when they don't know the Lord. Satan has a toolbox. You can think of it like that. And the people who are in that toolbox that he can use are people who are not fully yielded to God. So back to my example, your mother-in-law, She's not Satan. <laughs> now, she might be his tool, but she is not Satan. Come on, guys. Have an a, give an amen anywhere? Man, some of y'all, y'all getting in real trouble, and so am I. So I'm going to move to principle number two, okay? Principle number two. You cannot forget who the source is, but also look at this. When you're facing opposition, never forget who you are. Never forget who you are. What is your identity? Is there anyone in here who is a king, uh, like a, a daughter or a son of the king of the? How many y'all? How many y'all recognize this right now? Who is the Most High? Who is the one who has the universe in His hand? Who is He? Do any of you belong to Him? Would anybody in here say, "You know what? I'm a child of the Living God"? Would you say, "I'm a I'm a son or a daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords"? Well, then you know what I'll tell you. You got to remember who you are. You cannot forget this. Remember, listen, this is what happens to us. You were created in the image of God. You have a plan. God has designed you with purpose in mind, and he's going to keep you here until you fulfill it. He wants you to do that. He has a plan. God loves you. Like my wife always says, she always says, I think I'm God's favorite. <laughs> but I think everybody ought to walk around like that, right? Every Christ follower, you need to remember who you are. It's like, come on, Simba. Snap out of it. Y'all remember that movie? You know you were freaking out. You were, I know it's a kid's cartoon, but you know you were hyped up when that scene came and his dad was talking to him and it was like, remember who you are? And you were thinking, come on, Simba, go. Come on, bro, go kick Scar's rear end right now and it's time to take back over. You know what? Heaven feels the same way about you. Like, let's do this. You are a child of God. Remember who you are and all of heaven's cheering you on. Saying, yep. And God's like, that's my boy. That's my girl. Remember who you are. Hey, parents, I told you these were going to be some good principles. This is a great teachable moment for you, but also for your children. Look, if you have a kid that's being bullied, right, uh, you can apply these same principles. And, and, and here's the thing. Here, here, I know we all, we all fall into this. We typically do one of two things when, when we find out our kid's being messed with, right? One of two things. We, we, we get emotional or, or we get really practical. And so emotional looks like this. The emotional thing we do, well, you just, I'm, gonna, I'm going up there right now. I'm taking care of this, you know, all that, right? Emotional. Or I'm getting on Facebook. I'm telling them, you know, whatever. Um, but the other, the practical, practical is we, we'll, we'll talk to our kid. We'll say, Hey, go tell your teacher about this. Super practical. Uh, whenever this happens to you, breathe. Come on, count to 50. Other, other, little, other little things to get you calm down, all this. And then, and then, uh, and then dads, you know, we, we typically we fall into it. We're going to teach our kids a move. Like, oh, I'm going to tell you how to take care of this kid right now. See, back in Vietnam, we had this thing. I mean, or whatever. You know, <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, here, I grew up in the 80s, so I'm just going to tell my kids, sweep the leg. No mercy. You know, it was so funny. One time, this is when Jonathan was like three years old, and, you know, he was, he was I guess, being harassed as a three-year-old, the mean streets of Heber, you know, and uh, at school or something. 
And so we were going to, Kamani and I were going to sit down, we are going to talk to him, we are going to, and then uh, I, I came home and I saw him on the trampoline. And I guess when you have three older brothers in your life, you, you pretty much, you, you get taught lots of moves, right? So I come home and I'll never forget seeing Jonathan and, and Nathan, you, you probably don't remember this, but uh, he's on the trampoline with him and Nathan is teaching him, he's teaching Jonathan how to handle bullies. He's like, then when they're not looking, you hit them like this, boom, and they're gonna, and they're, and they're gonna crumble up it like, he, I don't know how old you were, like 10 or something. And then they're gonna d- kind of double over it and that's when you, bam, you knee them right in the nose. They will never bother you again. And I'm like, this is incredible, man. This is just, this is this is brothers at work, man. So, so, so you know, we're, we're going to go to the emotional route. We're going to going to get practical, and, and some of those techniques are good. Some of them, uh, but can we also be spiritual? Parents, I'm looking at you, grandparents. Open the Bible up with your child. Use this as a teaching moment. Show your child, and never let them forget what God says about them. Here's what God says about you. Get some verses out. Write a couple of these verses down. Are y'all, y'all getting this? And say, remember, this is who God says you are. You walk in this and never forget it. Amen? Amen. How does it help you to remember who you are? Here's, here, here's how it helps you. Because the purpose of persecution is to produce weakness, insecurity, low self-esteem. It's to make you walk in fear. And if you don't know who you are, then you're going to live under the thumb of someone who's trying to exert power over you all your life. I mean, it could be people, but ultimately we know it's the enemy, right? And uh, think about Jesus. I'm not going to take you here, but look at the Gospel of John. And notice all of the I am statements he made in that Gospel. He said things like, I am the way. I am the gate. I'm the door. I'm the bread of life. You remember these things? I am this. And and so there was a lot of theological concepts going on there, but also it was an incredible teaching on this. Like, I, I know who I am. You don't get to define me because I know exactly who I am. I know what I'm called to do. I know who I am. You don't define me. I define me. Do you see the confidence in that walk? Think about this, when Paul was talking to Timothy and he wrote letters to him, this was a son, he considered him a son of the faith. Like, in other words, he was a, a Christian son to him. He, he discipled him. So Paul was teaching Timothy. And remember, he got to one part of that letter and he said, Timothy, God has not given you a spirit of fear. But he has given you a spirit of what? Power, love, and a sound mind or self-discipline. Apparently, some opposition was coming against Timothy, and it was really messing with his, it was trying to steal his identity. And so we have to remember, remember who we are. 1 John 4, 4, look at this. You, dear children, are from God, and you have overcome the world. Come on, say, I have overcome the world in Jesus' name. All right, last one, last principle. Never pay back evil for evil. Keep that up there for a second. Listen, these, we have to remember who the source of opposition is, and we, we have to keep our eyes on Jesus and remember who we are, right? We have to know who we are. But this one, you remember I told you that Christ followers are to respond differently to opposition than the world does. This is it right here. This is it. Never pay back evil for evil. Romans 12, 17, it says, if someone has done you wrong, I like that translation. If someone has done you wrong, oh Lord, he done me wrong. You know, if someone has done you wrong, do not repay him with a wrong. Now this is a hard verse. Am I right? And and this is a verse that there's no way that I can pull off without the spirit of Christ living inside of me. And you can't either. You're not that nice. We, there's no way. We need Jesus on this one. It's one of those scriptures, though, it's, it's, it's a hard verse. It takes maturity, doesn't it? And it also takes blind obedience. Like, okay, God, I'm trusting you. This person wronged me, but I, I released them. I'm not even going to give bitterness a second to set in because I'm taking them off of my hook and putting them on yours, God. 
I'm not going to live that way. And here's why. I touched on this earlier. I don't want to decide someone's future. That's not for me to decide. Why? I should not be where I am in life. I'm, I'm only where I am in life because of God's mercy and grace. But I think you could say the same thing. You're only where you are in life because of God's mercy and grace. Amen? Besides that, I'll tell you something else. You end up looking really dumb when you enter into a mudslinging contest. I got to tell you something a friend of mine said. It's so funny. He said, if you, if you wrestle a pig, you both get dirty, but only one of you enjoys it. <laughs> Some of y'all don't get that. You'll get it later, but it's so good. Last verse. Ready? Matthew chapter 5. Is, it, is this helpful? Look at this one. Tell me after you read this. <laughs> Verse 43 through 44, and Jesus, he's telling us. It's interesting, his, his listeners would have been Jewish people. And he says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's what they believed at the time. That's, that was their custom. So yeah, you, you love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Jesus is about to flip it around. But I say to you, and I want you guys, listen, note these four things he's about to tell us to do. Okay? With our enemies. Enemies. So write them down, highlight them in your Bible, however you want to do it. But he says, I say to you, first off, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Love, love, that's an action. <laughs> love your enemies. In other words, okay, you consider yourself my enemy. Just because I'm outside of your circle of love doesn't mean you're outside of mine, though. Love, love your enemies. What else? He says, and... Bless those who curse you. That's about my words. That means I'm not going back and forth with them. My hopes for you are greater than your hopes for me. I'm, where there's cursing, I'm going to bless. I'm not getting caught up in that. Y'all understand that? It's your words. What else? Do good to those who hate you. What? Do good. Everybody say, do good. Some of you this week, I believe this, the Holy Spirit is going to give you an opportunity. The Holy Spirit is going to help you. He's going to show you somebody that you need to just do something nice for that person who dislikes you. You're just going to have an opportunity. God's going to show you what to do. Now, some of you, listen, please do not freak out if somebody does something nice for you this week. You're going to think, well, do they think I don't like them? Well, I like you, but, but the per but pastor said, no, listen, no. I'm talking about you, for you. God, the Holy Spirit's gonna show you who to do this for, okay? Do good to those who hate you even. And then look at this last one. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Pray for them, yes. What do you wanna pray? Pray that they come to Jesus. Pray that God does a great work in their life. Pray for his perfect will to be done. Pray for them to be overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Pray for them to have their eyes open to the purpose that God has called them to. Man, all these things, pray. Man, you do that, you'll be following after Christ. You will be. And so just to wrap this up, look, I want to, I want to encourage you guys. The opposition that is coming against you, some of you, that's happening right now, that opposition that is coming at you is nothing compared to the favor of God that is chasing you. Can't even compare. Do you remember in the Bible when David wrote this song? He said, surely God, your goodness and your mercy will follow after me all the days of my life. Listen, when you came to Christ, when Jesus entered your life, he brought his goodness and his mercy with him. Every day you wake up, he's there. He's like, what does goodness look like? Well, goodness looks like unmerited favor. It looks like likability. It looks like energy. Come on, somebody. Goodness, the goodness of God. It's the Holy Spirit operating in your life, opening doors you couldn't open. Goodness, man. And what is mercy? It's very interesting in this verse that I was talking about. The Hebrew word for mercy is hesed. 
And it literally means God's loyal commitment to me. His mercy is his genuine commitment to you in your life. Isn't that amazing? This is what you get. So no matter what harassment you're facing right now or will in the future, it can't compare to the favor, God's goodness and his mercy. And nothing can stop those in your life. Nothing. No enemy, no human, no spirit, nothing. Can I have an amen on that? Can we bow our heads? I want to pray for you. Father, I just thank you for this time of learning with with your church, with our church family. Lord, it's really strange sometimes when I would read in the disciples' lives and they would say, thank you for letting us suffer persecution for your name. I mean, they even suffered physical harm. But Lord, I know we don't face what they have faced yet. But Lord, I'm going to pray right now. God, I thank you when we can be reviled. I thank you when the world can speak evil against us. Thank you so much, God. It sounds weird to say, but I thank you because that means you count us worthy to be counted amongst your followers. And you said if we are partaking in your suffering, then we are certainly going to partake in your glory. And so, Lord, I thank you. It's like a seal of approval, Lord. I just thank you so much. And Lord, I pray that we will walk worthy, Lord, worthy of the calling, worthy of the calling, God, that you've given us on this planet. Hey, if there's anybody in here, I just want to give you a a time that you can do some heavenly business. You would say, "I, I need Jesus as my Lord. I need him as my Savior. I need him to come into my life because I can't do this anymore without him. He got on the cross so you could have forgiveness. It's the only way you can be made right with God and have a glorious future in his presence. Or maybe you're here and you walked away from God, you knew him, you were participating in this life that he called you to, but your life looks nothing like what he has called you to. And you say, I wanna recommit my daily walk to him being Lord over me. If that's you, no one else looking around, just raise your hand right now. I want to know who's in on this prayer. I'm not going to call you to the front, but if you would, would you look up at me till I see you? If you're raising your hand. Yes, sir. A young person right there. Somebody else. Anybody else? Yes, another young person. Another person over there. Yeah, if you lifted your hand up, you can go ahead and put it down. Just pray something like this if that was you. And and if you're watching via video, hey, you can pray this prayer. Just pray, Father, I, I love you. And I thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on a cross for my sin so that I could be made right with you. And Jesus, I am asking you to do that for me right now. Come on, just ask him. Forgive me. Ask him. Be my Lord. I give you permission to come into my life. You call the shots now. I believe in you. I believe you rose from the dead so I could have a new life in you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Get me plugged into your church so I can walk in your will the rest of my days. Amen and amen.